the world's earliest farming cultures evolved in North Syria, Turkey, Jordan, Thailand, and South Asia from around the 8th to 6th millennium BCE. Today's discussion is about the emergence of earliest farming cultures in South Asia. Explorations and excavations in Balochistan has revealed the earliest level of farming culture from this area. The site which has yielded wonderful evidence for this is Mehergar. It is located in the Kachi Plains in Balochistan on the banks of the Bolan River. This river actually uh, flows through a plain which is an extension of the Indus Valley into the Balochistan region jutting into the Iranian plateau. And the gorge through which the Bolan River passes is actually a connecting layer between the northern part of Balochistan and the valley area. This is the area where the silt deposits from the rivers and hill torrents had laid out an, a very deep, substantially deep alluvial layer so that the region has become practically the bread basket for Balochistan. And this very area is also the homeland for the earliest farming cultures in South Asia. Explorations were laid first by the pioneer French archaeologist Beatrice de Gaudi, followed by the French team led by J.F. Jarrier and Catherine Jarrier, and they have recovered substantial amount of evidence for us to now really be certain about the beginnings of the Neolithic agricultural sequence of human occupation in this region. Mehergar actually has yielded evidence for seven continuous layers of occupation, the first three of which are matters for discussion in this particular lecture. The first layer belongs to period one, and that is datable to around 8th to 6th millennium BCE. This period is actually, the first layer of period one is actually a ceramic Neolithic because there is no evidence for the use of ceramics here. The period 1b has yielded evidence for ceramic. Both the periods are actually related to the Neolithic culture. And we have the first signs of domestication of plants like wheat and barley and animal species of sheep, goat, and increasingly cattle. The reason why we have the development of this farming culture here is its geographical location. Kachi is a flat alluvial plain, an extension of the Indus Valley into an anomalous nick in the eastern age of Iranian Plato. Probably the Pleistocene Indus River flowed through this region, thus we now have a substantially deep alluvial layer. It is called the bread basket of Balochistan, as I have already mentioned. The Bolan River flows down a major route of communication between the Indus Valley and Balochistan the principal hydrological feature of the plain, and today runs along the eastern edge of the site. The earliest layer where we find the aceramic and Neolithic contexts is extended through two square kilometers at the edge of the Bolan Plateau site. However, it does not flow into the Indus, but disappears into the alluvium of the plain. There are other more seasonal rain torrents coming down the hilly slars of the Balochistan uplands. This geographical setting has facilitated the growing of wheat and barley, the main cereal crops for the people of the Neolithic civilization. Period one has yielded evidence for charred grains of naked six row barley and hulled two row barley, as also wheat of two varieties, ain corn and emmer. There is also wonderful evidence for animal domestication from Mehergar. The Italian zoologist R. L. Constantini has found evidence for sequential domestication of three species, sheep, goat, and cattle. Thousands of plant specimens were collected in the course of Mehergar excavations. These included charred grains and seeds, as well as impressions of grain on mud brick. Barley seems to have been the most important crop. In period two, in addition to barley and wheat, there were numerous seeds of cotton, gossypium species, found in a hearth. 
The Neolithic strata at Mehergarh has also yielded wonderful evidence for human dwellings. Sun-dried mud bricks laid one over the other uh, actually were laid out into compartmented buildings, single rows of compartmental buildings, which might have also served the purposes of storage units. The dwelling units were usually four to five meters square, frequently divided into small rooms of up to four or even six in number. Floors often reveal impressions of reeds. Fireplaces often found in corners of rooms signify their use as ovens, as we have traces of smoke on plastered walls. Brick sizes were almost regular. Compartmented longish buildings might have functioned as storage facilities. Eleven seasons of excavations at Mehergar has yielded evidence for a longish stretch of the site. The areas which have been segregated stand as MR1, MR2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. The evidence for the Neolithic has been found generally in MR3, MR4 and MR5 spots. Earliest evidence for farming culture therefore comes from MR3 and MR4. The sequence of occupation at Mehrkar is as follows. Period 1 and period 2 comprising the Neolithic actually were located in MR3 and MR4. Period 1 having the earliest layer of human occupation is dated by calibrated radiocarbon dating to 7th to 6th millennium BCE. Period 2 ranges from 5500 BCE to 4500 BCE. Period 3 is 4500 BCE. This is the very time from when we begin to witness the efflorescence of first farming village cultures throughout Balochistan. Period 1 at Mehergar has yielded thousands of microliths as well as hand axes or kelts. Stone items like grinders and mullers, stone querns were also part of the food debitage at Mehergar, period 1. Period 2 sequence reveals increased use of material things. We have compartmented houses increasing in number. For example, we've recovered the evidence for 23 compartmented buildings at the period 2 levels. Other assemblages include flint, blades, cores, beads, terracotta items like terracotta mother goddess pieces. Animal domestication is also evident at Mehergar from period 1. We find that among the assemblages there is variety of animals to be found, wild and domesticable species. Among the domesticable species we find more of sheep, goat and cattle with cattle increasing with time. The detection of size diminution of long bones in domesticable species signify that they were getting tamed with time. Such evidence also indicate that from period 1 to period 2 there was more preference for cattle than sheep and goat. Lorenzo Constantini's discoveries show that the people at Behergar were gradually transcending from hunting gathering to sedentary agricultural economy. The people of period one buried their dead in the open spaces between their houses. The bodies were placed in oval pits in a flexed position. The bones were often covered with red ochre, suggesting some kind of fertility cult. In at least two burials, young goats had been placed near the feet of the body. Grave goods included bitumen-lined baskets and food offerings, ornaments such as necklaces made of stone and shell beads, bone pendants and anklets. A copper bead was found in one of the burials. Pottery is introduced in period two. It is a soft, chaff-tempered ware, handmade with simple shapes. Wheel-made pottery made their appearance in period 2C. The faunal assemblage at Mehergar indicates that 
there was a gradual transition from hunting gathering to domestication of animals. Uh, we have among the period uh, one assemblage bones of wild animals like black buck, cheetal, uh, onegar or wild ass, water buffalo uh, and elephant. Uh, but we see as, as time progressed, there was a shift towards domestication of animals like sheep, goat and cattle. But uh, surprisingly enough, in period 3, we find that there is more of sheep and goat bones rather than cattle, which shows that there was a transformation from uh, agriculture to kind of uh, shepherding. And then again, there was also an increase in wild animal species. Does this indicate that there was a resurgence in hunting activity or did this mean that there was an equal balance between hunting gathering and agricultural activities? There is a very interesting evidence in the form of a copper bead. As it is, the finding of this copper bead at such an early level is very interesting, but more than that, it has been analyzed that some traces of cotton thread was adhering to this, co this copper bead. And this report has been made by Christoph Mullehart in the Journal of Archaeological Science, which was published in 2002. This is perhaps the evidence for the first use of cotton thread in the world. Another very interesting evidence also comes from period one at Mehergar, and that is the evidence for the world's first dentistry. Uh, in the graves, skeletons of nine adults were found to have their molar crown drilled with some kind of a very fine uh, stone blade, probably attached to a wooden handle. It seems that they might have used some kind of a botanical ingredient to put into the cavities that were formed in the teeth of these adults. This has been reported by A. Coppa and others in the science journal Nature in the year 2008. This is probably the first in instance of dentistry in the world's history. Subsequent reports from the medical professionals in the journals of dentistry have provided interesting perspectives on this finding of prehistoric times. Period 2 at Mehergar uh, reveals greater number of artifacts and probably a more complicated craft activity. Most interestingly, we find that there is a lot of activity for uh, stone blade industry. There is one very interesting example found in the form of a tool, a composite tool which might have been used as a saw or might have been used as a sickle. This is actually a piece of bitumen which has been inserted with three series of blades, small bladelets, diagonally on each parallel side. The whole composite tool acts as a saw or it might have acted as a sickle for cutting crops. This is a very wonderful innovation tried out by the Mehergar farmers. From period 2 onwards, there is distinct evidence for craft specialization. For example, in some area we find extensive signature for pottery making. For example, we have furnaces here as well as heaps of uh, broken sherds of pottery. Now this actually reveals the coming pattern of craft specialization in more and more complex village lives people were gradually progressing in their farming activities and they were providing scope for other secondary activities to the people who did not have to produce their own food. Excavations have yielded evidence for material culture of the people at this strata at Mehergar. For example, we have come to know about the stone tool types, about the pottery, about the belief system probably, because we have terracotta figurines from this site. We also have 
evidence for connections with other cultures in the neighborhood. All these have led to the development of a lot of ideas and debates regarding the diffusion of culture from other sides, as also the indigenous local growth of the Mehergar culture from within. I have with me my colleagues from the Department of Ancient Indian History and Culture of Calcutta University today to discuss certain points. Uh, here is Dr. Rita Choudhury, the head of the department now, and Hello. this is my younger colleague, Prita Bhattacharya, from the same department. Mm -hmm. Mehergar was one of the earliest cradles of animal domestication. Can we really uh, ascertain that? You see, it is not only the cradle of uh, animal domestication, it is probably also an independent cradle for uh, plant domestication. Mm -hmm. Now the whole problem relates to the matter of the natural habitat of the wild species which have been found domesticated in this area. See it starts with wondering about whether such common animal species like cattle, sheep on the one hand mm -hmm. and plant species like barley and wheat on the other hand were naturally available in the wild in the region. You know, now uh, as to that, we do not have much indication. You see, one of the earliest evidence comes from this area uh, about both the plant and animal domestications. Archaeologists have found sites from Syria, Lebanon, Israel, yes. southwestern <coughs> Turkey, and uh, Iraq and western Iran also. But even then, we do not have the wild taxa still mm -hmm. existing. It is because they are the most common edible and domesticated species. Mm -hmm. So the wild species is no longer to be found in the entire region. So what is the best clue then? The best clue is archaeologically available. And for this, since a lot of evidence in the wild form as well as in the domesticated form have been found from the sites, the uh, Neolithic sites in this entire region, mm -hmm. which is generally termed as the Middle Asia complex. Therefore, archaeologists have a general feeling that this is the cradle of civilization. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. As you know that Gordon Child had called it the cradle of civilization, mm -hmm. the fertile crescent mm -hmm. in the Near East. Mm -hmm. So this is the region which is generally held to be the heart of domestication of both plants and animals. But of recent times, what happened is that from 1960s and 70s onwards, certain evidence, evidence has started coming from Afghanistan and finally from Mehergar, which puts us to some other notions, you know. It, it leads us to question whether there was a single heart of domestication mm -hmm. or whether there were multiple Much. independent mm -hmm. centers of domestication. See, from Afghanistan, uh, L. Dupri had carried out excavations at the Akkupruk caves in southern Afghanistan. And there, uh, at about the date which uh, is goes about uh, 8000 BCE, there is enough evidence to show that there was both wild cattle as well as domesticated cattle. This is also true for sheep and goat. Now, this probably indicates that one of the earliest areas for independent domestication of these three animal species might have been Afghanistan. Okay. On the other hand, we have at Mehergar the entire evidence for both plant and animal domestication. And therefore, in this book you will find this discussion, Gregory L. Puzel um, has posited, he, he suggests that whether we should not think in terms of multiple centers of mm. domestication. So this is new area, these are the debates, but of course we need to ha carry out much more paleozoological and paleobotanical researches in other sites to understand fully the complex ideas, you know. Rita, can we have a little bit more about the material culture that we find at Meherkar, which might help us to mm. understand more about this site? Well, archaeologists have unearthed evidence of a long sequence of existence at this site starting from period 1 about mm. 7000 BC to period 8. Mm. And within this the first at the very primary stage 
we find huts of nomadic uh, pastoral people. This is followed at a later stage by dwelling houses made of handmade sun-baked bricks and some of them have already been identified as granaries though they were small in size. So we have evidence that people had already begun to depend on a, a past agrarian economy. Now granaries became bigger at a later stage and so there is definite evidence that they had begun to depend on this agrarian economy. Yeah. What is interesting in this period as we find uh, the evidence of a copper bead from a grave site. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But then the question arises uh, whether they were regular users of copper at this stage. Mm -hmm. We must remember that regular use of copper began in about BC 4000. Mm -hmm. So it must be a stray evidence of, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, that they knew about copper. Mm -hmm. But more interesting is, uh, than this is the find of a turquoise bead. This is not a local resource material. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. must have been imported from outside right. and most probably this was from Tukomania. Ah, so yeah. there is evidence of long distance trade from this period, period alone. Period alone. Yeah. Yeah. So this is very interesting yeah. because we have evidence then that from 6000 BC trade, long distance trade was known to the people at Mehergod. Mm -hmm. ah. When we pass on to period 2, the most interesting thing about this stage is that uh, they, uh, beca they became acquainted with pottery manufacture. Mm -hmm. Initially, lumps of clay was pu put on one on top of the other and they were shaped into crude uh, utensils. It's for handmade hand yes. mm -hmm. utensils uh, for their daily use. Uh -huh. Next, the next stage was they used to line baskets with absalt and bit bitumen like uh -huh. a sort of cement uh -huh. yes, to be yes. used as molds for yes. the potteries. Mm -hmm. okay. Then about 4000 BC came the potter's wheel. Mm -hmm. It must have come from West Asia, scholars think it must have come from West Asia since this potter's wheel had been introduced there uh, uh, at about 5000 BC. So we now we have a regular uh, manufacture of potteries and gradually they became more complex at a later stage when designs came to be inscribed mm -hmm. on them, natural designs, plants, mm -hmm. animals, then geometric, geometric, yes. geometric yeah. designs yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then gradually it became more complex uh, but, uh, pottery manufacture. Now speaking about uh, other things we find the use of shell and lapis lazuli. Oh. So again we have evidence lapis uh, of yeah. long distance trade because mm. these are not local mm. materials. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Shell could have come from the Makran coast yes. and lapis lazuli from the only place that we know of is Badakshan. Mm -hmm. So again we have evidence of long distance trade. Now initially also we find crude fi fi figurines. Uh, just one evidence from period 1 and gradually at a later stage in period 3 we find more figurines mm. which have been terracotta, terracotta mother goddess uh -huh, yeah. which have been identified as mother goddess right we have a uh, sickle blade has been found yeah, i have discussed it, <laughs> this already blade, so which has yes, been very interesting hafted on a handle with mm -hmm, bitumen mm -hmm. so this was perhaps one of the earliest evidence of a tool used for harvesting in mm. uh, this subcontinent. Mm -hmm. So uh, they had naturally we have evidence, definite evidence that agriculture has assumed a primary uh, position of predominance in their life. Mm. They had give, begun to depend largely on agriculture for their living though we must remember the other uh, sides of their subsistence like hunting and uh, food gathering has not completely gone out mm -hmm. of existence. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. also existed. From all these evidences it is clear that even before the Harappan civilization there is a trend towards moving towards urbanization mm -hmm. in this area much before the uh, Harappan uh, civilization came mm -hmm. into existence. Mm -hmm. What about the diffusion of this culture? You had talked about this earlier. Yeah. So please could you elaborate? From 5000 BCE probably 
uh, in the nearby region of Quetta, Zob Valley, Loralai Valley to lying further north of Mehergar, uh, there was this emergence of farming cultures, farming village units. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the earliest and most important sites is Kiligul Muhammad, where we have the earliest layer going even beyond 5000 BCE. Mm -hmm. And the period one actually was a settlement of the nomadic pastoralists. We do not have much evidence for dwelling units, but from later period, we start getting this wattle and daub houses. Mm. See, along with that, we also have evidence for animals. And at other sites, we start getting an evidence for paleo uh, botany also. Mm. So, it seems that there was an entire complex of agrarian villages growing up in the region, in the neighborhood. Um, and the other thing, very interesting fact is that even from Central Asia, we have got certain evidence for the use of a ceramic, which is very typical to the Kweta ware. It is very uh, similar to the Kweta ware, very mm. typical of mm. this particular region of mm. the pre Harappan Kalkolithic. Mm. So, uh, there is a possibility that there was an entire corridor. Now, this mm. Middle Asia complex, according to as I said, mm. according to G. L. Posel, he thinks that this the phenomena of the rise of agrarian culture in this particular region in northwest of South Asia actually is linked to whatever was happening in the fertile crescent region. Mm -hmm. And he says that this is the fertile crescent region is the nuclear zone mm -hmm. from where the culture had diffused. But again, uh, there might be a diffusion of the entire cultural pattern, but individually speaking, these cultures were trying out their own innovations, they were coming up and they were growing from within. So, mm -hmm. this is the thing that I had been trying to discuss, okay, the indigenous growth from within. So, what can we conclude from this? I think from what that we have all talked about, we notice that uh, there is a transition from a semi-nomadic pastoral stage to food production mm -hmm. uh, and life goes from a simple stage to a more complex stage. Mm -hmm. In the initial stage, we find changes like increasing sedentarism, mm -hmm. uh, craft production, use of tools in a variety of ways, mm -hmm. building of houses, mm -hmm. dwellings, mm -hmm. and then their identification and granaries is important in mm -hmm. the sense that there is the concrete evidence that we are changing from a pastoral mm. economy to uh, agrarian economy. Mm. Right. Then gradually life becomes more complex when we see in the uh, next uh, period that there is increasing craft specialization, mm -hmm. um, uh, complex administrative and social structure. Mm. And then from this leads into a more uh, uh, developed uh, society and economy. So when it is very interesting to uh, trace the various stages that to we reach, reach yes. uh, to which we have passed from right. a very early primary stage mm. to a more complex society. So, from all that we have discussed here, we can say confidently that the foundation stone for what was to happen in the urban calcolithic culture mm. was already laid in, in Mehergar and around Mehergar. Mm. So, Definitely. yeah, this is the this is the beginning of the village farming culture, which will finally support the rise of the urban culture.